it had to do with food. And it had to do with the fields the food came from and the way the people worked the fields, like these peasants in the Duke de Berry's Book of Hours. With 90% of the population on the land, any development in agricultural technology would affect everybody. And in the seventh century, 700 years before Agincourt, three agricultural inventions came, one after the other, to fundamentally change people's lives. The first was a new kind of plough. You see, up till then, the plough in general use had been little more than a, than a digging stick pulled by oxen. It came from the Mediterranean, where it's still in use today in the Middle East, and it was good enough for the job of turning over the light soil in that area. But up here in Northern Europe, it got you nowhere. Soil's too thick. So, when around 700 AD, this came along, it made a very big impression. It had wheels, it had a knife to cut through the sod, and the plowshare had a curved board attached to it. This new plow would cut through anything. Look. You see what the knife does? It cuts open the sod and makes it easier for the plowshare that follows. And then the curved board throws the soil up and away to one side, leaving a clean furrow. With a team of, say, eight oxen in front of this, you could farm the thick, rich land up here that no earlier plow could ever have done. It was bloody hard work, but it could be done. So by about 900 AD, this plow was opening up the north really fast clearing the forests, producing more food. And in consequence, the population was rising. Woo! Now, in those days, this would have had a, a team of oxen up front, not a horse. The plough and the oxen were very expensive. Few peasant farmers could afford the whole deal. So they formed cooperatives, each man bringing what he could. And as they began to work close together, they began to live close together in big groups, villages. That's why villages happen. So the first invention was the plough. The second came towards the end of the ninth century. The situation was that up till then they were using oxen in front of the plough, and if you put an ox harness on a horse, it cuts across under the neck and strangles the animal. The horse collar, that was the second invention, spread the load on the horse's shoulders, and so now you could use a horse. Now, a horse will do twice as much work as an ox because it does it faster. So, production doubled, and the population rose again. The third invention took them and their horses further afield. Yes, it was the horseshoe. See, with a shoe, you can use a horse in all weathers, over rough countryside, and it'll carry heavier loads further. So now you had a, a work animal and a transport animal. And by this time, there was plenty to transport because they were producing so much, they had a surplus. You see, at the same time as all this, a new crop system came in, the idea of using three fields, the three crop rotation system, it's called. One field is fallow, so the animals can graze on it and drop manure on it. One field is sown in the autumn with cereals, like oats, for example, to feed the horses. And one field is sown in the spring with legumes, peas, beans, carbohydrates, vegetable protein. This was why they dropped the longbow, because when you have enough food to sell the surplus for cash, you've got better things to do on a Sunday than obey the law and practice archery. People went into business, they opened taverns, they even played games. That's why they couldn't find any archers. Nobody was practicing. They were too full of beans. <laughs> Now, this may look very simple and rustic to you, but what you're looking at is the medieval peasant equivalent of thank God it's Friday. But all the more so, because they'd never had one before. A day off, I mean. Thanks to the agricultural revolution and the opening up of new land with the plough, there were actually spare goodies a peasant could take to market and sell for that amazing new stuff, money. All over Europe, the medieval lower classes started doing something absolutely unheard of. 
They started enjoying themselves. Some of them even started washing. The reason for all this dynamic activity was because as Europe recovered from the chaos and confusion of the 10th century, prosperity, <clears throat> if I could just have your attention for a moment, prosperity encouraged trade and merchants began to travel around selling anything they could get people to buy. Between 1150 and 1300, the population tripled. Towns grew up. So did the number of craftsmen and professions. And so did the paperwork and the bureaucracy. If you think about it, these must have been great days for most of them. And cash to buy things with, paying the landlord rent instead of forced labour, justice, perhaps, at the new village law courts, even a little personalised medical treatment. May have been a bit rough. But it was better than nothing. Well, almost. <laughs> OK, so a peasant couldn't get to be a prince, but he could expect his kids to grow up to a better life. Meanwhile, as the rustic rollicking continued, in the king's palace, it was lead balloon time. I mean, here were all these hayseeds committing the unforgivable sin of not doing their duty, which was to work till they dropped and practice a longbow on Sundays. Remember the longbow? It took a lot of practice to make a good archer who'd go out and get himself slaughtered for you, and these idiots weren't getting the practice. It began to look to the kings and princes as if you couldn't go out and have yourself a nice old-fashioned war anymore. And then good old human ingenuity came up with a less demanding way to kill people. Now, to be fair to the Europeans, they didn't actually invent it, but they took to its immense destructive potential with all the gay abandon of an alcoholic in a brewery. And in case you're wondering why I'm telling you all this with my pig friends here, it's because the, one of the first places they found the principal ingredient for the new terror weapon was in a pigsty. Why? Well, you see, a pig's home is also his toilet, and you make gunpowder from urine and dung. Using that kind of muck to get to this lethal powder involved going through a bit of chemistry first. The urine became ammonia, and the bacteria in the dung turned the ammonia into a nitrate. Having mixed the mess with wood ash and then filtered water through it all, boiling that water produced saltpetre crystals. <laughs> 